Hey everyone, Veronica Valencia with Popverse here, and I am joined today by comics writer, X-Men expert, Chris Claremont. How are you doing today? Well, so far so good. That's good. How's the heat treating you? As long as I stay inside, it's quite delightful. Going outside, it's certainly <laughs> one, every other step one can say it's warmer than, cooler than Dallas. There you go, there you go. Mm, not a good thing. No. Now, you, when you started out, I would say you didn't intend for a career in comics, but you know what was it about the medium and you know continuing to write X-Men that you enjoyed writing and kept writing? Well, in brutal terms, it paid really well in those days. And honest answer. <laughs> I'm really good at it. I mean, no, I started out. Originally, I started out as a political theorist, and then I discovered acting, which was far more fun, and unlike political theory, a real challenge. And that was my goal. Writing was just something I always did on the side. And, you know, going back to late childhood, it, give me a piece of paper and a pen and I'll start scribbling on it. Um, I would start scribbling on it. But, I was working originally at Marvel as um, an assistant editor and then associate editor and then basically number two editor in the whole comic line under Len Wein, who was editor-in-chief then. And again, I, I thought this was something I would do for a while and then uh, go off for summer stock and do auditions for Off-Broadway and Broadway and eventually work my way up the, the food chain. And I was good at that, except I w was better at writing. And uh, again, getting the X-Men was an accident. Len and Dave Cockrum had done Giant Size number one and then Len decided to, it was time to move on from editor-in-chief and his exit deal was four monthly series, which was all he could, he felt he could do brilliantly. So something had to go, and the, since the X-Men at that point was just a, min, a bi-monthly mini series, not mini series, sorry, bi-monthly ongoing series, he didn't have time for it. Mm -hmm. So since I had been peeking over his shoulder, the whole time he and Dave were building, constructing, writing, and drawing giant size number one, and since I'd come up with sort of like a crucial element of how to end the story, um, and I really liked, loved the characters and wanted to work with Dave, I tackled Len and told him, I want the book. Mm -hmm. And Len, just to get rid of me, said, okay. <laughs> Again, none of us thought the X-Men would turn into what it is, because if any of us knew, Len wouldn't have let me anywhere near it, mm -hmm. and, and rightly so. But you know, the opportunity to work with one of the most brilliant creative artists of that era and on brand new characters. Essentially, we were relaunching the title mm -hmm. with a whole new crew and a whole new uh, agenda. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and one that will, in the current iteration of Marvel, likely never happen again. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I went with it, and the rest, as they say, is history. For sure. And then, when you were stepping into it, were you going into it with the mindset of like, I want this to be my passion project? No. I wanted to work with Dave. And I wanted to see what would happen next, and we just... Basically, writing a series is, for as long as you can get away with it, an exercise in what happens next. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the defining element for me, for... Well, until I got fired the first time, 17 years later, and each time I've come back, I want to see what happens next because mm -hmm. the characters are extraordinary to me, engrossing. Um, they haven't always turned out the way I, en I envisioned them, but in that context, I can adapt mm -hmm. quite easily. Mm -hmm. But again, the whole industry as a as a business model, as a creative model, has 
changed, evolved drastically since, you know, God help me, the 50 years since then. So one adapts with it. Mm -hmm. And along with these characters that you've made and with your background in acting, would you say there, um, with that knowledge, did you use any of that to try and help create your characters and maybe it's, the choices they make? Not necessarily. I mean, the difference is that you're approaching the concept from totally different perspectives. Mm -hmm. I mean, acting is a function, even in a one-person show, you're dealing with other people on stage, either reality or imagination. But it's, it's integrated. Mm -hmm. Whereas in writing, all the characters, all the actions, all the situations come out of the back of the writer's brain. And it, it's a matter of seeing how far one's imagination can reach and in how many different directions and then what happens next. Mm -hmm. But it, to me anyway, it's always a matter of what happens next. Uh, if a character turns, turns left, turns right, if, if Gambit had come to the X-Men not as a hero, but as a villain, if, whose, whose ambition was to destroy them, what would happen next? Actually, that was his original <laughs> intention, but then I got fired the first time and everything went totally differently. And we've been talking a lot about X-Men just now, but do you ever feel like it's, you know, you've made such a name for yourself with these stories. Do you feel like it's harder to branch out and do other stories? More challenging. Okay. But the most challenging element of that is not so much doing the other stories, because while I was doing the X-Men, I was doing Marvel Team-Up, I was doing Doctor Strange, I was doing the Fantastic Four, I was creating Excalibur and uh, New Mutants and Wolverine. So I was branching every which way. The problem as time went on is that Marvel evolved into a series of divisions. You had the mm -hmm. Spider-Man universe, you had the Avengers universe, you had the Defenders universe, you had the X universe, and uh, on one level Marvel kept wanting more and more X product because that sold. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, each subordinate editor who was directing each ancillary group had their own writers, their own story larks, their own way of doing things, and who wanted this ego head coming in and, and mucking up the business? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all, it's, it's all finding your way through a fairly complicated mishmash of, of rocks and puddles and piranha and army ants. Uh, you don't know where where it's safe. You don't know where it's. You're stepping on someone's toes, and again, with each generation of editors, you have an evolution in how they approach the business. And in turn, as the company became more successful and and branched off into other elements such as films and television, there were a lot more facets to, to relate to, to, to balance into it. Um, the, the comic book Marvel Universe is significantly different in concept from the film universe. Oh, I can imagine. And how do you balance that out? And who, and since the film universe deals in success in terms of billions of dollars, and the comic book universe deals it, with it in terms of, oh look, we can pay the rent this month there's a significant balance, difference. I mean, when I started, Stan had three rules. Get the book in on time, write good stories if you can, and don't be a pain in my ass. Any two out of three, you kept your job. But he'd like all three, but he had more important things to do, like keep the company alive. Mm -hmm. So within that parameter, 
one had the option, Dave and I had the option of doing what we wanted, of, of coming up with ideas and running them by someone just to say, does this sound sensible? When I was working with Wheezy Simonson, probably the best editor, along with Archie Goodwin, I've, I've ever worked with in comics, I would come in on every now and then go, I have no ideas, and Wheezy would go, oh, really? Well, have you thought, you know, what about this question and that question? You know, have you ever, you never answered this? And I go, oh, damn, that's really good. And I go off and have another 20 stories. It's poking the writer in the right direction uh, and seeing what happens next. It's as much a voyage of discovery for the editor as it is for the writer looking at stories. Now, it is a considerably more structured universe. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there are conferences where they plot out the editors and writers plot out the next two years. This is where we're going because this works. And it's interesting getting used to it. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's, it's taking the, the LA TV series model and sort of applying it to, to comics. And like it or not, I come from a much more fluid and freewheeling, and I, I confess solipsistically, a potentially far more creative era. Now, that doesn't mean you can't slip on a banana peel and crash spectacularly, mm -hmm. but as Archie Goodwin was fond of saying, okay, you screwed up, you got 30 days to fix it. If you don't fix it, then we may have a discussion. But you've got the next issue to make it right. Mm -hmm. um, so, again, everything changes. The Wright brothers started out with a little pep, two, two wing putt putt, biplane putt putt, and now we've got 380. I was walking out here and an Airbus 380 flew overhead heading for Miami International. And it's like, Planes are bigger, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, the whole plane is longer than the Wright brothers' first plot flight, which is awesome in its own right. Yeah. And you've just had such a great explanation about, you know, your experience, getting feedback on your stories, and experimenting with different storylines. Now, in terms of other stories, what's something that maybe you've worked on that you absolutely loved but maybe don't get to talk about as freely or as much. Well, I, I actually got hired to write the, the, the story arc for the Gambit movie. Oh, okay. what? Which is great, except Channing Tatum didn't quite love it. So it went into the, you know, it's, that's the problem. It's when you're working for hire, you're always, you know, in, in a movie sense, you're, you're dealing with what the actor who's going to play the character really loves. And sometimes the actor doesn't know. Uh, that balance, but, I'm, so, I'm sure, can just be kind of well, hard to find in the beginning. Well, it's, again, it takes... I, I wrote a trilogy of novels uh, in conjunction with George Lucas of The Willow, the sequel to The Willow film, uh, where I created the whole world, because Willow itself takes place in a very small area of, of that world and a small amount of people. So I thought, what's outside that, that sphere? And George really liked it. But at that time, he was focusing on young indie, so there wasn't any really any interest in Lucasfilm in pursuing it, the book either in terms of sequels or in terms of spin-offs. So now Ron Howard is doing a spin-off, but it's completely his. There's no aspect of the novels in it, which can be really frustrating. When, when Days of Future Past was written for the film, I love the film because it had the right ending. Actually, not so much Days of Future Past, I'm sorry, uh, X-Men 2, where Brian Singer swiped a tremendous, well, what was for him a tremendous amount, but basically for me, just a couple of loose ends 
from God Loves, Man Kills, which if you had to say which X-Men am I the most proud of, that's in, in the top two. Uh, and top one? Well, there is no top one. <laughs> top two is parallel, would have to be the Dark Phoenix saga. And then, well, I don't know, there's, you know, the problem with it, you can't pick, I can't pick just one, because each time I do, I think of something else. Mm -hmm. But the, the thing with, with X2 is, God Loves, Man Kills was a very specific book written with a very specific point of view at a very specific time. And to take just two gratuitous character elements from it and put it on into X-Men 2, A was for me a waste of, a misreading of what the story was, all, the original story was all about and B a waste of the characters. And you could have just as easily made it Joe Blow and his kid. Mm -hmm. And it would have had exactly the same impact not a negative impact at all, a positive impact, but it would have been just as impactful. But it had a name element. You could put based on or derived by, this by. Yeah, well, do better. You're, you're supposedly a genius in Hollywood. Come up with a better idea. Or if you're gonna use my idea, do it. It's like when, when Fox got around to producing Days of Future Past, Sorry, I'm zap, I'm vamping again. The Wolverine. The original, the, the, the Wolverine was a story that the producer, Lauren Schuler Donner, had wanted to generate, wanted to do for years. So Fox first said, do an origin. Then when they came around to doing the film, the first draft screenplay, which I read, was pretty much Frank's and my story. And that was great. I figured, okay, the second draft and the third draft will hone it down, mm -hmm. hone it down. But it never happened that way. The, the director, Darren Aronofsky, won an Oscar. Natalie Portman won an Oscar that year. And he figured, I don't need to work for Marvel. I can do my own stuff. So he did. So the film went into restructure. And the first two acts of the movie are essentially drawn from what Frank Miller and I did in the graphic, in the miniseries. The third act goes in a totally different direction and has, for me, a much less successful conclusion to that, to that film and that story. But that's, again, it's not my $200 million. It's not my, this is something that, that... You can only do so much. Well, it's also, the, the film is a matter of a synergy between the, ideally, the star, in that case Hugh Jackman, and the director, it, or the producer and the director. It's not the writer, even though none of this would exist without the writer, either the writer of the original source material or the screenplay, the writer is actually at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of producing and bringing that film to life. But that's, you know, that's the left coast. If if a writer really wants to do his or her own work without in interference, you're either an artist writer like Walt Simonson or Frank Miller, or you go write novels, where theoretically you have no problem other than whether or not it's any good, which is always a challenge. But that's a challenge we all that's, face with each story. And that's a whole other ball game, I'm sure. It, it's interesting, I'll give you that. <laughs> well, thank you so much for all that insight and you know, sharing with us your characters and your stories. We truly appreciate it. Well, the, the best closure I have for this is I'm not done yet. I've got a Gambit series that star, that'll, the first issue will hit the stands in three weeks from the convention. I'm not sure when you're, when you're going on the air. Up at the end of July, and that's a five-issue miniseries that I hope it'll do. It's some unknown, untold stories, and I'm trying for something adventurous for me, which is comedy, ah, and drama, but comedy. And you've been enjoying it. Oh, it's a great artist. <laughs> he's, a, he's a brilliant character. What's not to enjoy? And then there's another project 
that is very close to my heart that I can't talk about because it won't be announced until the end of the month. But ideally, I think it will make the, the readership, especially the Classic X readership, go woohoo about time. <laughs> because this is the most important thing from my perspective. I've been doing this for, God help me, 50 years. But I now have three full generations of readers. That is from unheard of, of consistent readers who keep coming back to read the old books and to jump into the new books. That makes me greedy. I want to see if I can get to four. Mm -hmm. But with enthusiasm, with excitement, with an eagerness not simply to enjoy what was, but to see what is and think about what is coming down the pipe, mm -hmm. which is, one hopes, the goal of every writer. But if it, along the way it makes Marvel and Disney, fingers crossed, a whole lot of change, Mazel tov. It, but that's the name of the game. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll be sure to be on the lookout for that. We'll be super excited when it drops. And you all out there, we want to hear the woohoos as soon as you get your hands on it. Absolutely. <laughs>